referring to it being the first is something that's very exciting for us because when you look at what investors can get um, exposure to and value creation can come from, this is true value creation. Taking things that have been tested, that work, putting them together in a way that takes a project that was good and actually make it now. Lowest cost mining method, highest grade deposit, even today we could make a very good return at Phoenix. And that's what gives us uh, so much energy around advancing the project now. Even if the commodity price doesn't go to $65, the project still goes ahead and still gets built and you still get the developer re-rate. Hello and welcome to Crux Investor. Thank you very much for watching this video. Please remember to give us a like and if you want to leave a comment below, we try to get back to absolutely everyone. And for those of you who have not already done so, please click the subscription button in the corner of the screen. And of course, if you want to see more videos like this, click the notification bell. We speak today to David Cates, who's the CEO of Denison Mines. They're a uranium player in the Athabasca Basin with some of the highest grade uranium in the world. We talked to David about his business plan and how he thinks that's going to give him an edge over his peers and competitors. We discuss financing to date and financing in the future, plus uh, the salaries that the management team are taking down. These and lots of other topics in the description below. Click on the relevant timestamp, that'll take you to that part of the video. Anyway, let's hear what David had to say. Hello David, how are you sir? Matt, I'm doing well. Thanks very much. Hey, well, thanks for coming on the show. There's, you're, you're one of the big names in the space. And, you know, we've been following the story. It's a very interesting uh, time at the moment. Some uh, snippets of information coming out last week from, from the DOE, a little, getting a little bit exciting. So um, maybe a, a timely conversation. So why don't we kick off? Give us that one minute summary for people new to the story, and then we'll kind of get into it. Yeah, no doubt. And, and thanks very much for having us. Uh, Denison is a uranium development company. Uh, we're focused in the Athabasca Basin in northern Saskatchewan in Canada. And uh, our flagship asset is a 90% interest in the Wheeler River pro project. And this is the largest undeveloped uranium project in the eastern portion of the Athabasca Basin. And really our story is focused on building on a pre-feasibility study that we put out for the project. Uh, about uh, a year and a half ago. And that's all about developing the super high grade Phoenix deposit as a very low cost ISR operation. It'd be the first ISR operation in the Athabasca Basin. And really the potential to compete with the lowest cost producers in the world, uh, like in Kazakhstan. Yep, fantastic. Thanks, thanks for that summary. Well, why don't, why don't we get into that pro Wheeler project first of all, because obviously you are you know, Athabasca Basin, world famous for being, you know, high grade uranium uh, deposits. So can you tell us a little bit about Wheeler, how you got into it and, you know, what the, what the plans are? Well, Wheeler has been in the uh, Denison family for a long time. Uh, project was optioned from Cameco uh, back in the day. Uh, and at the time, uh, the project had no, no known uranium deposits. And really our team uh, over the last 10 years has found two high grade uranium deposits. Uh, the first was Phoenix. Uh, in the, around 2008. Uh, Phoenix became really well known in the last uranium cycle because of its super high grades. And we've been able to uh, delineate and increase the size of that resource to the point where we now have over 70 million pounds, U308, uh, at an average grade of over 19%. So that does make Phoenix the highest grade undeveloped uranium deposit in the world. Uh, 2014, uh, we found a second deposit about three kilometers away from Phoenix. Uh, it's the Griffin deposit, also high grade, uh, grades around 2%, and you're in the range there, 65, 70 million pounds as well. Uh, that Those two deposits were taken forward uh, for a PEA, or Preliminary Economic Assessment, almost four years ago now, and that was really designed to sort of stress test the project and, and say like, hey, can we do we have enough pounds? Can we make money on this as a co-development scenario? Uh, we did, and, and we, we, we used sort of a, a typical mining methods, nothing fancy about that. We used uh, jet boring at, you know, at, at Phoenix, the same as they're using at Cigar Lake, and we used underground mining at Griffin. Uh, where our story, and real, really this history is important for, for Wheeler, because we could have left it there, right? Uh, you know, the project was generating a 20% pre-tax IRR at $44 uranium. I mean, you know from interviewing many of the other companies that that's, that's something that most people haven't done. And what I mean is run a price deck at $44, right? Um, but we looked at it and said, 
you know, the Phoenix deposit was actually coming out as being lower margin than Griffin uh, at the time, using that jet bore mining method. And we really rejected the validity of that because here we had a 19% average grade, highest undeveloped, highest grade undeveloped uranium deposit in the world. How could it be that this was lower margin than a 2% uh, basement hosted Griffin deposit? And that's where we got to the PFS. So we've increased the level of confidence here. We've gone from a PEA to a PFS, and we've switched mining methods of Phoenix, selecting in situ recovery. And that's got us now positioned to have potentially the lowest cost in the business. But uh, again, I want to kind of keep this simple because there's going to be guys watching this who are uranium buffs. They know everything that there is to know. Uh, and then there's going to be a bunch of other guys, generalists, who are coming to uranium space when they see this market pick up. So can you just kind of break down what ISR is versus conventional mining? All right. So, I mean, certainly there's a selection of mining methods in the uranium space, right? Um, historically, you've seen open pit mines used for shallow high grade deposits in the Athabasca Basin. You can look at our own McLean Lake uh, deposits, which have been mined out uh, on that basis. Uh, Griffin fits really well as an underground mine. It's in uh, competent basement rock. So this is dry rock uh, in the Athabasca Basin. You have a, a very large geologic formation. It's, it's literally a basin or a mm. bathtub. Uh, above the basin, you've got sandstone and you've got a tub of water in that sandstone. Below the tub, you've got those basement rocks, competent things, the kind of thing you'd want to tunnel in. So Griffin fits really well as the basement hosted uh, deposit, fits really well with underground mining. Be very similar to Cameco's Eagle Point operation. Uh, it's great. It's a dry mine and, and actually the grades at Griffin are, are high, but not too high. So we can use very low cost underground mining methods and we don't have to worry about the sort of radiation exposure associated with high grade deposits where you're using man access mining techniques. So, so Griffin is a good story that way. You can move to Phoenix and Phoenix is hosted actually in the Athabasca sandstone. So it's not hosted in that basement rock. It's actually in that permeable porous sandstone. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what allows us to, to look at using ISR mining. So over half of the world's uranium production today is coming from ISR mining. Right. And those are all sandstone hosted deposits. Uh, and it's really all about, can you move fluid or solution through that host rock to be able to actually use ISR mining? And, and I guess if I just back up one step on that, in ISR mining, it's in situ recovery. It's a mining method that's uh, mining the target mineral while it sits in the host rock without extracting that rock. That's what in situ really means. And to do it, you're using a series of wells uh, that drill into the ore body and around it, and you inject the mining solution and you pump it through a series of pump wells and it comes out of a recovery well where you're pulling that solution out. And as it moves from an injection well to a recovery well, you're actually leaching the uranium in ground and pulling up really only what you want and not pulling up uh, the waste product, right? right? You've left the stuff that you didn't want in the ground. And so on surface, you don't have a big processing plant with uh, you know, crushing, grinding. You don't even have a leaching circuit. You've done your leaching in ground. On surface, you really just have a plant that takes that uranium-rich solution, drops out the uranium, and then refortifies your mining solution and sends it back in ground. So totally total spectrum of mining methods in the space and the project that Wheeler has exposure to two of those different methods being underground at Griffin and, and ISR. Right. So I think, I guess, conventional underground mining, people un understand that because, you know, that's, it's used the world over. But you're saying ISR is used in, what would you say, 50% of the, of the world's uh, uranium uh, production, yeah. so it, it's half, half of the world today is is uh, ISR mining. Correct? Right, so it's it's fairly conventional in that sense. It's a well understood technology. There's nothing new about it. Um, and in Canada, is it well understood? Is it used by other companies? Well, in in Canada, this would be the first ISR uh, uranium mine. Uh, right, but but what I would say is that you know in the United States, in Australia, in Kazakhstan, uh, ISR mining is happening all day every day. Okay. So people in Canada who are familiar with the uranium space are certainly familiar with ISR mining. Right. So it's, it's, it's well understood technically. Okay. And I guess you've got people on the team who've been there and done it before. Um, how does that work in terms of getting permissions, permits, licenses for using ISR technology in a country like Canada 
he hasn't seen that before. I mean, where, where are you in that process and what does it involve in fact? And, and, and if you can help us, have you had any pushback in terms of this lack of understanding or if there is lack of understanding and how do you manage that? No, look, that's a really relevant question. Um, you know, to be able to do something for the first time anywhere, uh, no doubt people want to understand if there are any sort of unique hurdles to that. And, and permitting is an important hurdle. It's actually the critical path for the project. Right. So maybe, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll respond with a bit of a story on this. Um, you know, we, we, we really looked at this uh, on our own before we selected the mining method. You know, when we spent that two and a half, three years going from the PEA to the PFS, uh, one of the questions we had was, well, are we going to be able to use ISR mining in the Athabasca Basin? And it's not just to us about the regulators. It's also about the indigenous communities. You know, will we get pushback from stakeholders or, 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 or rights and treaty rights holders uh, that, we, that we have in our, in our uh, part of the Athabasca Basin? And we did two things, a uh, little bit risky, but uh, we socialized the mining method selection because we were we had more than one that we were looking at for the PFS. But what do you mean socialized? socialized that. What, does that, what does that mean? Well, socialized means that we, we talk to the regulators and the indigenous communities in advance of selecting it. And it was a bit of a risk for us because honestly, it was quite top secret, uh, the mining method selection. But we said, look, we certainly don't want to pick a mining method that the very first thing is the regulators are going to say, well, I don't know about that. Or secondly, and frankly, more important, that the local indigenous communities would say, you're definitely not doing that in our backyard. And so we actually held workshops uh, with the community. We, we showed them different mining methods and we allowed them to give us input on which mining method we should select. And, and the thing that connected typically on ISR mining with the communities and the regulators is the lack of waste. Uh, the fact that we have minimal surface impact, the fact that we are not going to have lasting tails. We will not have a tailings dump the same way you would at McLean Lake or at Key Lake. And these communities are familiar with those and they realize that these things are there for a long time. They love the idea that ISR mining simply doesn't have that type of impact. So, you know, we, we really wanted to test it before uh, it would be a problem to make sure that it wasn't a problem. And the story itself for permitting is is largely an environmental impact story. And so we launched that process uh, almost a year ago with the submission of a project description. Uh, the CNSC, the Canadian Nuclear Regulator, and the Ministry of uh, Environment in Saskatchewan will co-regulate this process. Um, right now, we're in the process of preparing the next level of study to ultimately submit submit an environmental impact statement. And really, this process is about understanding the impacts of your project on the environment. And when I look at ISR mining, and we've got a great slide in our slide deck on this, uh, in our January slide deck, and it talks just about how ISR mining at Phoenix is different. But when you really go down the list of what are the impacts associated with this mining method, uh, they're really minimal. And so when I look at our path forward, I really focused on what is the scope of the environmental impact associated with the project? Because that's really what this process is about, is understanding the impacts, the way you're going to mitigate them, and the way you're going to monitor them. And our process with Phoenix and the ISR is really quite straightforward, and we feel like it actually charts a simpler path forward when it comes to actually going through the environmental assessment. How do you get a better sense of how long this process is going to take and what the potential hurdles are down the line? Because you, you in your deck, you talk about starting production in 2024. I'm, I'm assuming given funding is in place, et cetera, and we can come back to that. But the, it's, the, it's the permitting licensing objections, which I should say the long pole in the tent here, You've just started the process. Do you have any sense of how long that takes? Well, yeah, I mean, look, <clears throat> the process is certainly uncertain in terms of how long it will take. Mm. Um, our, our duty, right, and what we can control is submitting that environmental impact statement. Uh, then the ball does go into the other court. The important thing is while we're working on that EIS, we're not doing it in a vacuum. And you can see from the story around how we assess the mining methods, we're not doing anything in a vacuum. We're bringing the communities and the regulators along with us because it is a learning curve. What I would say, though, on um, eliminating, you know, some of those typical concerns around ISR is it is really technically driven. Uh, a typical ISR operation, uh, 
will will and look the greatest concern and i'll be blunt about it the greatest concern with an isr operation is that you're injecting a mining solution now look it could be an alkaline solution it could be an acidic solution mm. we have an acidic solution that's how the chemistry works mm. when you inject that into the ground people ask well where will it go now we will have done all sorts of work to model the hydrogeology of that deposit so we can follow the flow but in a typical isr operation i mean in kazakhstan or the united states and the way that they will control the flow of the mining solution is by putting a ring around the mining horizon of additional recovery wells. And what they'll do is they'll make sure that they always suck solution into that, always recover a positive amount so that whatever they're putting into the middle isn't evacuating that ring. Okay, that's how every ISR operation in the world will operate. What we're talking about has that approach as a redundancy okay we're, we're we're putting a 10 meter thick ice wall over top and around our deposit and connecting it to those competent basement rocks that's our containment it'll be the first fixed containment or chamber of mining that you've ever seen in isr now we can do it because our deposit is so high grade and so small right now, if you were dealing with typical isr grades 0.05 percent you'd have to freeze or create a cap over square kilometers of ground. Yeah. We don't have that issue. We can create this very tight dome over top of our deposit. So our primary containment is a 10 meter thick underground ice wall. So t tell us a bit about that, because that seems like an engineering feat in itself, right? So that that's expensive, no doubt. But again, has it been done elsewhere? Um, have you guys done it before? Well, look, it's, it's actually not that expensive uh, and it's actually not a technical uh, feat other than that we would be combining the freeze ground freezing technology with ISR mining. That's a first. Right. But ground freezing in the Athabasca Basin happens every day of the year right now at MacArthur River and Cigar Lake. So, Interesting. The, the, you know, and I'm happy to go into how that works. Um, but, but I think the really a point that has to be hammered home is that environmentally, we will have that perimeter of extra wells. It'll be outside the freeze dome, right. which means that when we go through that regulatory process, we can explain to the regulators and any party that's interested that our redundancy, mm. our redundancy is the industry norm. That means we're already achieving a higher standard, right? Mm. And that can put people at ease that even though we are using an acidic solution, we really have the, the means to control this and eliminate those common environmental concerns. It's interesting, you keep using a phrase there, you say you'll be the first to do it, you'll be the first to do it. And if, you know, if I'm sitting judging this, even with my banking hat on or otherwise, the, the first to do things worries me because it's not been done before, it's not proven before. So, you know, when you're doing your EIS um, and indeed applying for your EIA and stuff, you know, that must be a phrase which worries the regulators too, no? Well, I mean, like, it's important for me to be clear about that. Um, the, the thing that's first is the combination of things that have already been done and exist and are tried, tested and true. Uh, nothing that we're actually doing is earth shattering other than combining these things. So let's look at ground freezing. Every day of the year, we've got uh, freeze holes drilled into Athabasca sandstone at MacArthur and Cigar, a freeze brine that's being pumped through it, and it's freezing the water that's in the host rock. We have the same kind of host rock. So freezing happens all day, every day at two different operations in the Athabasca Basin. ISR mining. We're not doing anything special there, other than that we've got very high grades, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but injection wells, recovery wells, in sandstone. So there's nothing really new about that. Uh, what we've done is just put those two things together in a way that unlocks potential that nobody's ever seen before. And I actually think that referring to it being the first is something that's very exciting for us. Because when you look at what investors can get um, exposure to and value creation can come from. This is true value creation, taking things that have been tested, that work, putting them together in a way that takes a project that was good to medium of middle of the pack and actually make it now lowest cost mining, lowest cost mining method, highest grade deposit, potentially the lowest cost uranium producing asset in the, the world. The so I actually think that 
quite exciting. The numbers look good. The numbers look good. So let's get back to that question. How long does this process take? Are you going to have to guess at that or have you got, do you know something? I mean, is it two well, years? No, is it no, 10 nobody, years? Nobody knows how long the regulators will take. But is it near two or is it near 10? What, what, where, where are you hoping? Yeah, so, uh, from our model, we've modeled it's a one to two year process once we've handed the EIS over. Right. Okay? It's definitely, look, that's going to be our job is to ensure that it's on that type of timeline. Um, but these processes can take longer. And, and I think the key is the less you have in terms of environmental impact, the fewer impacts you have, right? The lower your risk is that you're going to encounter a delay. If you have a very long list of things that the regulators or the environment or the communities need to consider, it's any one of those sets a one or two year delay. The shorter your list, the lower your risk. Okay. And what are the things that you're spending most of your time and money on in terms of a, as a percentage that concern you the most about getting this thing done in that two year time frame? Right. So critical path for us to complete that environmental impact study is finishing our environmental assessments. So that'll be a priority in 2020. And along with that, you're going to have metallurgy, right? Metallur it's, this is a geologically driven deposit where metallurgy is very important because we are, of course, leaching the uranium in ground. Uh, so we are running a, a barrage of, of metallurgical tests to take our work from the PFS standard up to a feasibility standard so that we can get that data into our environmental uh, assessment process and ultimately have that inform this environmental impact statement. Right. So those are our priorities. Okay, and so it's, it's all about Phoenix. That's the first asset project you want to get into production and Griffin comes along, I think you're indicating you know, in a five, five or so, six years later. That's, yeah. that's, the, that's the way the economics run, okay. Um, can, we, can we talk about um, numbers? Money. So you've raised, how much money have you raised over the period that you've been getting Phoenix up and running? Well, if we look at Wheeler, uh, historical costs we've spent, uh, as a JV, we've spent $100 million plus uh, on finding those deposits and moving them forward. Okay. Right. And you've, you've, you've raised money just consistently over, you know, each year you're, you're dipping into the market. You did another raise pre, in December, I think it was, or was it November? December, I think. Yeah, we've look, I mean, the, the money we spend matches the project, right? So we've, we've raised big bucks for exploration when we've had a deposit to delineate. Yeah. Uh, and we're raising smaller amount for exploration now because we're actually focusing more on discovery of new ISR amenable deposits. And so we're not going as deep into the exploration side of things because really the value creation is going to come out of developing Phoenix. And we don't really want to be uh, diluting shareholders with big exploration budgets right now. Uh, but we do want to keep our, our mind and our team uh, focused on finding additional ISR amenable deposits because we do think we have an advantage on that front and can add a lot of value. Right, some exp there's exploration happening as well. That, 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 that's good. Um, is part of that $100 million, is that that 20, there's a $24 million credit facility in there as well? By Novus, is it Scotiabank? Uh, no, Bank? No, or is that no, separate? So that, that, yeah, the $100 million is is a historical spend on Wheeler. Um, when you look at that $24 million credit facility, mm. so that's, that's a letters of credit facility, uh, and we issue letters of credit off of that facility to secure our reclamation obligations at McLean Lake, right, right. where we have uh, historical mines that have been mined out, and of course we have the McLean Lake Mill, which is licensed and operating okay, yeah. and processing all of that ore for Cigar Lake. Oh, fantastic, fantastic. And uh, part, part of that deal is you need to keep $9 million bucks in cash on deposit at all times, and you're you've not, you're not having any issues with that. That nine million bucks is there. Yeah, it's it's restricted. It's uh, it's held by Scotia on our behalf, and, right. and and basically that covers part of that credit facility. You got it. Right. Okay. What is the cash position today outside of that nine million? Yeah. So we reported Q3 cash, just around ten million dollars. Yeah. So that would be the unrestricted cash. Right, and the, and the burn rate, I mean, when does that see? I'm guessing where I'm getting to is, are you going to come in back into market anytime soon? Um, and you know, what sort of quantum you're looking to raise at that point? Yeah, so we, so we raised 4.7 million Canadian in the fourth quarter. That would be on top of that uh, 10 million. Uh, at the end of the day, we're a development company. So while we do have sources of cash flow mm. from Uranium Participation Corp and from our environmental business in Northern mm. Ontario, We've got a contract with BHP up there where we take care of their, their closed uranium mines. But while we do generate some cash flow from that, 
we're going to need more money. Uh, yeah. It's a it's a development company. The key with us is that we we're very uh, fiscally prudent. We really do plan our activities out, uh, and we really do have a, a, a path to finding the right window of capital. You know, it's it's an interesting thing when you um, when you have a shareholder like Lucas Lundin, uh, you 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 manage your dilution carefully, because at the end of the day, uh, Lucas Lundin and, and frankly myself, uh, the money that I've invested in the company, uh, we're we're not going to make a return, the type of return we want to make, if we're uh, swamping our shareholders out with big equity raises that are poorly timed. Now, that said, there's always a tension between moving the project forward and the value of bringing that production forward and being on time. Because every year that your start date moves, you're affecting today's NPV, right? So we'll always be juggling that. We certainly don't love equity at these values. Uh, we'd look at other asset disposals. Uh, we'd look at other ways to raise money that, that aren't linked to the share price. Okay, so let's look at that. You, you had about 10 million bucks um, in your, your September uh, statement. You're burning, you burned about a million bucks a month um, prior to that. Is that right? You know, basically, I'm trying to work out what you burned between then that statement of 10 million bucks and today. It seems to be, you know, to me, you know, three, four million bucks would have, you know, been spent on the development activity. I'm again trying to get a sense of you know where you're at today, and I, I know there's probably a December statement coming out soon. But uh, you know, where are you at with the cash? Yeah, so we, yeah, so we would say that our year-end statements are coming out. But um, look, at the end of the day, when you look at the spend, we disclose our, our plans for the year crystal clear uh, yeah. in our MDA, and, yeah, and we're yeah. really one of the only developers to do that. Um, but you have to understand that year-to-year -year plans change. And so the scope of spending really is variable to a certain extent to the, with, and, and adjustable to the cost of capital, right? Uh, so, you, it's, so I would caution against using, say, 2019 and the monthly burn as a proxy for, for 2020 and the monthly burn. What I can say yeah. is that our sort of G&A overhead costs are in the range of $5 million Canadian, and we generate somewhere in the range of 2 to $3 million Canadian in cash flow from running Uranium Participation Corp and from our environmental business. Tell us about those, because you know I'm, I'm trying to, you know, I was focusing on, on on the spend, but you do have some incomes from a couple of sources. Can you just tell people about those? Yeah, so we've been the manager of Uranium Participation Corp. So this is a publicly traded company on the TSX under the symbol U uh, since its inception. And this is a company that holds physical uranium, uh, has about 18 million pounds U308 equivalent in inventory. Uh, and we, we are the administrative and commercial agent or manager for that company. And so independent board of directors, they've hired us. We have a five-year contract uh, with UPC and we get paid a base fee plus a variable fee that changes based on the net asset value of UPC. So the higher the uranium price and the, and the higher the value of UPC, the more money Denison's going to make managing that. Wait, we'll what, what, do you, what do you get from them? How much do you get from them? We'll earn about $2 million Canadian a year managing uranium purchases. Okay. And, and really, that's all about leveraging our experience in the space and, and our reputation. Because when UPC was formed, uh, you know, over a decade ago, it wasn't that easy to go set up storage accounts uh, to buy and hold physical uranium. And so that was really the marriage there was saying, look, Denison is a known player in the space, has these commercial relationships with the converters and the enrichers, and we could actually go and set up those accounts for UPC and use our commercial knowledge in the uranium space to actually manage UPC's inventory. So that's UPC. If we go to the environmental side, uh, we have a closed uranium mine in Elliott Lake, Ontario. Mm -hmm. It's uh, very famous uh, in, in Canadian uranium mining. Mm -hmm. uh, that district would have been the Athabasca Basin before there was an Athabasca Basin uh, historically. And we've closed and fully reclaimed that mine, which is uh, quite an accomplishment. And, and actually is the mine is used by the CNSC to tour people from Canada and internationally to show them what a closed and fully reclaimed mine can look like and, and a success story. Uh, so with that, we have a team of people up in Northern Ontario that take care of our site, but we also have a contract with BHP and they've acquired a company along the way that had a number of uh, closed uranium mines in Northern Ontario right around our mine. And so we offer them 
uh, care and maintenance service, like what we're doing at our sites, mm -hmm. but for their sites. And we'll earn somewhere in that range of one to two million dollars from that business segment, not just from BHP, but from that business segment. So that's three to four million bucks potentially from both yeah. of those. And you you talked about five million bucks as your development budget. So it's not bad. Take that. Yeah, five million dollars is that uh, G and A overhead budget. Exactly. Okay. Oh, that's the G and A component. So there's a development budget on top of that, is there? Yeah. So funding for the environmental assessment or any technical work is on top of that. Okay. And ex exploration as well, right? Five million is the keeping the lights on cost. Keeping the lights on cost. Okay. Okay. I get. I get the sense of the numbers now. And can you just uh, very and very quickly the last sort of component here, the McLean Lake uranium mill. What does that mean for you? Because you've got a 20, what, 22 and a half percent share of that. So you're not operating that. You've just got a share in it. Is that, is that the setup? Yeah. So the, the mill is operated by Arano, uh, formerly Arriva. So yeah. uh, uranium nuclear giant out of France. And we have a 22 and a half percent interest. We will argue that it is a strategic interest because there are very few people that actually own an interest in an operating, well, operating or licensed uh, uranium mill. If you're looking at operating uranium mills in the Athabasca Basin, McLean Lake's the only one that's actually operating. If you look at licensed mills, you are restricted now down to McLean Lake, Key Lake, and Rabbit. Uh, those those assets are closely held, basically owned by Cameco and Arano. So Denison really is the other party in that mix with tangible physical asset there in the McLean mill. Right. And what, what does that get you? You, you got a, you got an eighth of this asset. They're processing twelve percent of the world's global uranium currently. Mm -hmm. What does that allow you to do? When you start producing, you get you get uh, your pro rata portion to be processed through that mill at whatever rates. I mean, how do you negotiate the terms on something like that? Yeah. So good question. Anything that goes through the McLean mill that isn't from the McLean project is going to require a toll milling agreement. Yeah. Uh, toll milling agreements generally are going to require two out of three parties in that joint venture to vote for it. So having that 22.5% is an important thing because it means that we're not another party knocking on the door of the McLean Lake mill yeah. to say we'd like to develop our mine and send our product to you. We actually do get a vote on, on that toll milling agreement. It's important to be clear though, um, Phoenix, for example, does not require the McLean mill. For Phoenix, we will be building our own processing plant on site at Wheeler, but Griffin is really a beneficiary of the McLean mill because you know the capex of building an underground mine and the front end of a mill is not insignificant. And with Griffin, we've been able to really squeeze the economics on that on that deposit because we're not building a billion dollar mill, right? McLean Lake, like I joke with people, but uh, that, that I could show you receipts. Uh, we basically could show you receipts for about a billion dollars of costs that have gone into the McLean Lake mill. So even with a 22.5% interest, you, you, you know, deduce from that something in the range of over $200 million in historical costs, or even replacement value, probably a little higher today uh, for that asset. And you know, for us, it's important for Griffin, but it's also important for life after Cigar Lake. Uh, so right now the mill is operating under with a toll milling agreement for the Cigar Lake joint venture. And all of those pounds that are coming from the Cigar Lake mine are being processed at McLean. We already used that stream of income to bring in $43.5 million a few years ago, where we sold that stream to Anglo Pacific. So that's an example of where we've already made good use of it because we didn't have to issue equity. Most of what we've been spending outside of exploration dollars has come from that financing that came out of the McLean mill. And for us, that was 8% money and it de-risked what would have been a critical cash flow for us, right? What's left is that there's still a mill and there's still a licensed mill, even after Cigar Lake produces and mines out. And today there's a 6 million pound mill essentially sitting there idle because McLean's licensed for 24 million pounds and it's only running 18 million pounds from Cigar Lake in any year. So you got 6 million pounds sitting there, idle, licensed capacity. Right. So you, given that Griffin's not going to be in production anytime soon, that that's a revenue stream potentially for you. When does when does the Anglo Pacific uh, stream run out? When's that? So it, it's mapped to the Cigar Lake mine. 
So any right. pounds that come from the current uh, sort of defined resources at Cigar or the, the ring fenced areas, yeah. that'll be captured by that. Toll. When is that? I don't, I don't know enough about it. Well, Cigar Lake has the potential to go, you know, another 20 years, but it really depends on what happens between phase one and phase two and whether Cameco is able to make a decision on it. Um, there was also talk uh, in the PFS about rare earths. Is that, uh, is that a strong reality of being a byproduct credit or not? Well, it's something we want to do a little more work on. Uh, not something that we've gotten any sort of economics at this stage, uh, nor will we need it. But uh, something that definitely we'd, we'd want to look at. Right, but you're not going to get distracted by it anytime soon. It's not a big focus. We don't need, we don't need to. Why, why did you talk about it? Why did they talk about it in the FS then? Well, I think it's an interesting area to pursue uh, from an optimization standpoint, but it's certainly not core to the to the project. Right. Okay. Okay. So it's been an interesting two, three years in the uranium space. Do you, how are you faring uh, up? How how are you? Yes, I was going to say that's a delicate way to put it. <laughs> it's been tough, right? Yeah. Look, it's it's been tough. I would say that um, we're blessed with the project because uh, if, I, if I had to wake up every morning and, uh, and, and look at a project that needed $65 uranium uh, to be able to move forward, I think it'd be a pretty depressing place. Um, you know, $65 uranium is, is, is going to be here, but it is a question of when uh, and, and on, what, on what trajectory, you know? And, and so I think we, we've actually been really blessed and we've actually quite excited about our story despite the market uncertainty and despite the fact that we keep seeing record low prices, because even today we could make a very good return at Phoenix. And that's what gives us uh, so much energy around advancing the project now, even if the cost of capital is high, because we have to look at how will we make money in this cycle? And the way that you'll truly generate a return for your investors is by producing the pounds, right? Or at least having visibility to those pounds coming out of the ground. Um, we're not looking for the rising tide of an exploration company in this company. We're looking for a proper re-rate from developer to producer. And we believe that positioning ourselves that way right now will give the investor maximum torque to whatever happens with the commodity price. But with this beautiful insurance policy that says, even if the commodity price doesn't go to $65, the project still goes ahead and still gets built and you still get the developer re-rate. But let me ask a question, you know, what do you need to see the price get to, to incentivize you to, because you don't want to get into production for break even, right? No, no one wants to do that, whatever that number actually turns out to be. What, what's the number you're looking for from the market? Well, we break even at $9 US. Sure. But what, what do you need to get going here? I mean, you, what are you telling well, me? You, I would get it, get in production tomorrow if, if you get the finance. Is that, is that what you're saying? Yeah, you'd, you'd argue that that's a possibility. I think for us, the biggest question will be uh, the cost of capital for the build. You know, are, are we comfortable with the remaining price that's nest, you know, built into our equity value or the cost of debt that's available and how costly is that? And will it be cheaper if the uranium price is higher? I don't really see the uranium price driving the actual decision on the asset so much as it does informing the cost of the capital. But for I sure. think it can and it can have a good return and the shareholders would do well. It's a question of how well uh, with the cost of capital. Okay, so remind me about your CapEx cost based on your PFS. For Phoenix, to get this show started, it's uh, around 325 million Canadian. Right. Okay. And you have to remember, like when we look at that, uh, we've got a slide that gives you sort of that cascade of production. Yeah, I got it. We, we, have, not, we have not gone and maximized that. Right? We've actually gone and put together something that's commercially reasonable. Um, you know, it's if we wanted MPV to be as big as it could be, we'd have Griffin and Phoenix happen at starting at the same time. We'd spend a billion dollars in CapEx up front, and we'd have, you know, 15 million pounds a year of production. What we're trying to do is make it realistic, right? And so what we've done is we've said, look, Phoenix makes money today, does not require higher uranium price. CapEx is low, 325 million Canadian. Let's build Phoenix. Let's use that cash flow to fund Griffin as a second stage. And let's use the production from Phoenix, which doesn't need contract cover to make money. Let's use that production to incent the utilities to sign 
long-term contracts or the Griffin operation, right? The utility looks at it and says, how do I sign a contract for an asset that doesn't exist? I need my uranium. The best way to sell to them is to have uranium production before you sell them the contract. And that's really what we're trying to do with this, right? And that's why the plan has been put together this way commercially reasonably. And that's why, important thing, we think raising $300 million is a totally different task than raising one, 1.5 billion, you know? Uh, and that 300 million, we believe is available in a moderate to almost today's uranium market. We don't believe it requires 50, $65 uranium to be able to access that kind of capital. Can we segue off of that just very quickly? There's a lot of talk in the market about mergers at the moment. And you're talking there about raising one, 1 billion, 1.2 billion, 1.5 billion bucks. And there's a few names that spring to mind there, obviously, um, which is, I think, bringing on this um, talk of, of mergers. Do you, do you see some of the other players in the Athabasca Basin needing to come together to kind of get this funding in place? Or, would, or should they be smarter like you and say, hey, let's bring that CapEx down to something more manageable, get into production, pr proof of concept, proof of route to market, and, and get going? Do you think their plans are too big? Well, look, I think there's a, there's a lot in that question. <clears throat> um, you know, we, we made a purposeful decision to design the project this way. Yeah. Um, part of it is that if we had brought all that Griffin production forward and maxed out our NPV, mm -hmm. it, would, it would lead us into a, um, into a path where, where we'd have disappointment potentially ahead for our investors because it'd be difficult to realize on that NPV, right? You'd have to be spending a billion dollars, raising that money, building a shaft and an ISR operation at the same time. It's just not realistic in our eyes and it's too high risk, right? So let's take a more measured, and sensible path. That's what we've done on the CapEx. We do think lower CapEx is a relevant thing right now. In terms of M&A, if I were to step back, I mean, I'd look at Cameco, right? And, and Arano. These are the big boys in, in the Athabasca Basin. Uh, they both have declining production profiles. Cameco has a great stable of assets between MacArthur and Cigar. These are high grade mm -hmm. and large. But at the end of the day, even they will admit, and I watch many of their investor presentations and attend many of them, but even they will admit that the time is actually now or yesterday to be advancing the next phase of mines in the Athabasca. Now they can't justify it when they have producing assets that they're curtailing, but even they will admit that today is the time to actually be moving these assets forward if we want to have that new production fill the gap that's emerging in our space in that 2024, 2025 horizon. So ultimately, I think when you look at M&A, it's, it's Cameco and Arano that have to look at how will they replace their production? How will they grow to meet market needs? Uh, they don't have other assets that are queued up. Now MacArthur is a great asset, it'll come back online and that's, that's a reality, but they need pounds even beyond that and they, they admit it. And so I think there is, there is a reason to understand that there will be an M&A slant uh, for many of the players in the space. I don't see it happening now because you've got MacArthur River shut down temporarily. It'd be a very difficult thing in my mind for Cameco to go out and acquire assets when they have truly the world's largest and highest grade uranium mine parked for the time being. Okay. Do you, do you, see, do you see yourself as a takeout target? Are you gearing yourself for that or do you genuinely want to get into production? Look, I don't, I don't see a takeout uh, anytime soon. And so I, I think it'd be a bit risky for us to develop or advance ourselves as a, as a, as a takeout story. Uh, we, we really are laser focused on building uh, the project and we've built the team to be able to do that. Are there any other projects in the Athabasca Basin, excluding your own, which projects in the Athabasca Basin do you think that you would like to work on? Well, look, I mean, NextGen has been huge, hugely successful. Uh, they have a very large high-grade uranium deposit that no doubt will be a mine uh, at some point. So uh, it's hard to hard to answer that question without talking about Arrow. Uh, it's, it's a really it's a great deposit and it's they're, they're a good company. So uh, we wish them the best and, and I, I I wish I certainly wish that I was involved in that company before they found Arrow because then I'd have a lot more money in my uh, 
my dreams than I do now. <laughs> <laughs> they've done. They've done well. well. Well, well. Talking of money in your genes right now, you know, I'm I'm, I'm looking at your MDNA. And you know it's been a t it's been a tough few years, and you know I like your business model. I always like talking about business models, and this is an interesting one. And you know it's going to be a lot easier to raise three hundred twenty-five million bucks than perhaps you know one billion three hundred twenty-five million bucks. Um, mm -hmm. You know all things being equal, and but you you guys you guys have you know we, we you, you talk about you know. Um, you know how people we talk about how people remunerate themselves okay and you guys have a sort of one line item in there i mean talk about management as, as you know base and variable fees i assume that's just a salary right so you pay yourself a salary you don't pay yourself through a, a management firm or consultancy which builds the company it's just a salary you're an employee right yeah absolutely and, and you know the best place to look for all of that stuff is the management information circular um because yeah, exactly. It's 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 really it's really clear. Our salaries are pretty reasonable. Um, they're 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 not aggressive. We do take a lot of our comp and equity. Yeah. Uh, and and actually, what you'll see if you sort of look through some of those footnotes there is for the last several years. I mean, we have a structured bonus plan. It's our executive incentive bonus plan. The last few years, the management team has taken almost all of their payments out of that plan, in stock or options, right? keeping the cash in the company and building our personal leverage uh, to the company's success, right? So we're, we're, we're trying to be very reasonable about that uh, and recognize that it's better that we align ourselves mm. with our investors rather than enrich ourselves right now. And, and the comment I was making about cash in my jeans, I did mean that personally, uh, because you have to understand that, you know, I've been with this company 12 years. Uh, we've, I've seen up and down in the uranium space I've been the CEO for the last five years, uh, but this is a mature company. And so the stock that I've built up, uh, it's, it's by buying it in the market or earning it through those uh, bonus payments or things like that. None of this is penny stock, right? All of this is market price stock. So I'm underwater, like many of the investors right mm -hmm. now, on almost everything I've got. Well, definitely on every share I've bought right now, I'm underwater. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think it's an important part of our story because our team is hungry, right? We've got a bunch of people on this team at the VP level that they've got stock and they're vested, but they're not gonna get a payday unless this project gets built and we have this proper re-rate. Nobody on our team's already made, you know, millions of dollars on Denison right. at this point. So, how, so just so I understand it, how, how many of the management are actually on that base and variable fee cost? Because to the nine months ending September 2019, you know, you're looking at about 1.4 million Canadian, I guess. So maybe that comes up to about 1.8, 1.9 million for the year. I mean, how many people are sitting, taking out of that? So, so are you looking at Denison or Uranium Participation Corp? I'm looking at Denison at the moment. Yeah, so we, we don't, I'm just pinging you on that because we don't, we don't disclose that sort of base and variable on Denison. Okay. Um, Right, we do we do disclose sort of the executive, you know, the the key management uh, comp. Mm. But what you'll see is all of the VPs are on a structured system where there's a mix between a base salary mm. uh, and the long-term incentive plan, which is equity grants, either RSUs or stock options, and then short-term incentive plan, which is that bonus payment that I'm talking about. So the entire VP team is on that. Uh, so that's that's myself, our CFO our VP commercial, our VP controller, our VP operations, our VP exploration, and even our council. So okay. that's, that's the team that's all being uh, compensated on that basic scheme. If you don't mind, can you tell us a little bit about what this year holds for you? 2020, it's gotta be a big year. You know, we, we, you know we're, we're reading about you know, US and Canada finalizing the joint action plan on critical metals or minerals and then you've got the DOE announcement from last week and you know the, some positive noises from Cam the likes of Camico etc I mean it feels like things are starting starting I don't know how many false dawns we've had in this industry but starting to turn um, what in terms of your business plan are you planning to do today 
and what are the things if you think the market does does move you know in the second half like a lot of people in this industry hope it does that you can quickly implement to kind of get things moving i imagine obviously permitting is a bit of an issue for you at the moment because you're not quite sure about the timeline there are you having conversations around the financing of this 325 million for instance have you got something already in the bag waiting or is that just dependent on you know permits coming through before you can even start those conversations yeah i mean look number one on the market i'm i'm actually quite optimistic uh, about 2020 uh, we really are starting to see uh, road signs if you will that are pointing us to an improving market uh, anything that takes out the uncertainty that we've seen over the last two years from the Section 232, uh, you know, failed Section 232 petition in the Nuclear or Fuel Working Group in the United States, anything that takes that sort of uh, uncertainty out of the market is positive. We are seeing utilities uh, participating in the market more, just starting. I mean, I'm talking in the last month, right? Mm. Uh, these are really important signs that, that we actually might see this market start to move fundamentally in the right direction rather than move uh, sort of by the traders and on momentum. So I am optimistic about 2020 for the market. Uh, we talked about it. I mean, our story is less reliant on the market than others because of mm -hmm. our cost profile in Phoenix. And so our focus will be the critical path uh, for moving Phoenix forward. And that really is the environmental assessment process. So you'll see us again working on environmental assessments and metallurgy, moving that process towards uh, the completion of the environmental impact statement. That'll be our priority in 2020. Uh, we sort of have three streams on the project though, right? So permitting environment one, uh, technical studies and feasibility work, that's stream two. That's more variable to us. We can, we can choose and time that uh, as we want based on that cost of capital. And then you have stream three, which is actually lining up the financing. So our CFO certainly will have that mandate of advancing this uh, on a sort of soft, granular basis now so that when we do go to raise the money for the project, it isn't a rush job, right? We'll be lining that up. I guess you could add sort of a fourth stream is exploration. Um, look, we, we raised that 4.7 million Canadian. We're gonna spend it in 2020. And, and our focus is actually on adding pounds at Phoenix uh, within the existing confines of that freeze dome. And when we run the economics on that, it's a, it's a trade off, right? You know, like spend the money now to add pounds that you'll mine towards the end of your mine life. Do you get a return on spending that money now for delineation? We looked at it, we did that analysis. We said the NPV today of finding more pounds under the freeze dome is quite positive. And because we don't have to change the extents of the freeze dome where we're looking for these pounds, they're really incremental. And so we, we are gonna be working on adding pounds within the freeze dome at Phoenix as well. Okay, so that's that's a big one. So can I just come back to the financing with the CFO? Obviously, like I say, you know, permitting is a big bit of that. Um, you've done a PFS, no one's gonna give you money off the back of a PFS. There's gonna have to be a feasibility study done at some point and eventually a DFS. So, you know, th these things take take time. Um, have you any idea, can you give us an idea when those things start kicking in, when you're gonna be in a position to move to the feasibility for study, for, for, first of all? Look, great, great question. Um, for us, we're not rushing the feasibility study. Okay, it costs money to do it. Uh, cost of money is high. Uh, for us, what we're trying to do, line up the environmental assessment and that feasibility study to come together at the same time. It's an iterative process as you go through the environmental assessment. And so your design and your plans are going to change at the same time. So why mark your feasibility study now only to have to redo it? We're, we're basically moving them together to have them converge. Right. And that allows us to make our, our cost of capital along the way, right? Because we're not doing anything we don't need to do on the feasibility study, so we have to do it to line up with that timeline. Okay, so, so the CF, CFO's got a pass for now. He's, he's got a while where he needs to start having those soft conversations, right? I'm sure he's busy with other things. Um, no, but you know what? It, it, it's, not, it's not a pass because at the end of the day, we need to know what elements the the of the feasibility study need to be where for us to access that capital. Right. And we're looking at bank for this, right? You know, we have such a high operating margin that we're looking at this as being appropriate for bank debt. So we need to know the technical guys at Scotiabank, right, who already lend to us, how do we get them over the that hurdle 
so that they're comfortable with what's in the feasibility study. So he's he's not off the hook yet, the CFO. <laughs> you know? like, I give him a hard time because I, I was the company's CFO. So he already has a difficult role being the CFO for the guy who used to be the CFO. But, but look, he's a pro at this and he's been with us for the last five years. So he knows what we're trying to do. And it's really about getting the, the lenders on side before we complete the feasibility study. So that when we are done the feasibility study, now it's a question of pressing the button to say, yes, we are going to lend you that money. Okay, but you know what I mean? It's a case of pol polishing the data that you've got and getting new data in before he's able to kind of you know, get fir firm up on that one. Your, your focus is EIA, let's get that thing over the line, get people to uh, buy into that. Can you answer the question, which I, I think I didn't pick up on because you didn't answer it, which was you are going to need to go to market soon because you're a development company, of course you are. Um, when are you going to do that and how much do you think you're going to raise this time? Look, I think anyone who gives you a simple answer on that is, uh, is a little bit risky. Um, look, we, we, we manage our business in a dynamic uh, industry, right, in a dynamic time. So for us, it's really about assessing the cost of capital uh, against the value of the work ahead, right? And right. so there is no right line or, or, or specific quantity about this. It's about managing those two. If the cost of capital becomes very cheap, and uranium price is very high, well, then we're, we're, and we like the value, then we might raise more money so that we can move all of those four streams forward very aggressively. If it isn't, then we'll be selective about what we do to maintain our schedule generally, right, while accessing minimal amount of capital to manage our dilutions. So there's no, there's no, uh, you know, black and white answer to that question. What do you th and obviously share price has been you know, sliding down since, you know, August last year. Um, you're in two exchanges, aren't you, first of all? You're, you're in the TSX and, and um, the NYSE. Um, you think that's just going to be a factor of whatever's happening in the market? Or do you th what do you think the things that you're going to do or say are going to change people's sentiment towards your, your stock? Well, look, Matt, you're right. Like uh, share prices in the sector are down. Um, I will say for the record, um, we've outperformed our peers each of the last two years. Uh, 2018 against our peer group, uh, we were down 6%. The peer group was down 26%. 2019, we were down 16%. Nobody's proud about that, but our peer group was down 36%. Yeah. So we, we have been a good story and it's driven by what we're doing with the project and investors are paying for that. Um, you know, <sighs> Like, yeah, I, I guess, you know, it's whenever we talk about equity values, it gets me a bit frustrated because I always see us as being undervalued. Uh, but, you know, the, sec the sector is undervalued. What can we do about it? Well, we buy stock. Um, I've been buying stock. You know, I, I participated in an offering, that $4.7 million offering. I picked up almost half of my salary in stock, right? So... I saw that 68 cent flow through unit as a bargain. I bought it. I bought more stock in January, just over 50. Right. This is all on set. I publicly filed. Uh, so you can do that. Um, and, and ultimately, I think our story is really actually well positioned for, for the market to rebound because we do have news flow ahead. Um, you know, most developers struggle. People who go through permitting, firms that go through permitting, they often struggle with that part of the mining life cycle where the story is a bit boring and people look at, well, what can, what, what, what happens? I mean, the project's already great. So all that can happen is your permanent could get delayed or now you're gonna have to start spending your money. For us, I mean, we've already come through that, that sort of negativity. Now it's about building on the story of actually building the project. And we actually have meaningful news because your points on ISR mining, uh, not everybody believes, right? And we are carrying out a series of test programs that can de-risk that. And so de-risking this process actually unlocks value. And so we do have, you know, things like metallurgy or the permeability results from our 2019 field programs. These are things where we've made some releases along the way, but there's little to come. And all of that does give us our stock actual real catalysts that can de-risk the project and actually add value and drive the share price higher. Brilliant. David, I like, appreciate you spending your time today with us. Um, I do stay in touch. I think you've got, you've got something good going on there. Uh, I'd love to keep sharing this with the, uh, the, the viewers and subscribers to our channel. Thank you very much. Hey, uh, my pleasure. Thanks very much for the interest and, and for all your subscribers and their interest. Uh, 
we value the opportunity to, to tell the story. So thanks again.